The Holy Land off-road jeeping, all coming up on today's edition of First Century Foundations. Well, welcome back, and we're still here with Yaron on today's program, and we are in a really historic place. We're just on the uh, western side of the Sea of Galilee in a very famous place called Mount Arbel. Uh, an event took place here 2,000 years ago that introduces uh, a character of history to us. You know him as Herod the Great. And many Christians only know Herod because of what he did to all the babies in Bethlehem and uh, because of what he did to try to have Jesus killed. But he's not called Herod the Great because he's a nice guy. He's called Herod the Great because the way he thought, the way he came against his enemies, the way he built was great. Tell us in a few minutes, Yaron, uh, the story of our bell. We can see some caves in here behind us. Tell us of the events that happened here. When Herod became a king, not all the people on the land of Israel liked the idea that he's a king. Right. He was Edomite. That's right, Edomite, yeah. He wasn't a Jew on the beginning. The Edomite became Jew later, okay. and the Jew acts to him or react to him as an Edomite. And when he became a king, because the Roman said, "You are the king," right. they didn't like it. Before him, it was the Hashmonaim. Right. The Hashmonaim are Jew, very famous. Okay. The Hanukkah is connected to the Hashmonaim. Right. And, and we talked about that in a former the, show. Yes, That's right. Of course. And now, when he became in the uh, uh, king mm -hmm. in the Galilee, they didn't like it, and when he was involved in other war, mm -hmm. so they said we will revolt against him. Yeah, and they revolt. Revolted, yeah. And when he heard about this revolt, it was the first revolt. He said, "Hey, mm. this is something that I can't accept." Right. More than that, the Romans, their people, the master of the Herod the king, yeah. told him, "Hey, you have." something strange yeah take care of this take care of the backyard that we have right and he took care of he arrived here with the army and arrived to this cave and said hey how i do it what is the way that i can bring the people outside of the cave now okay why were the people hiding in the caves for they, protection this is for, for protection okay this is the place they can protect and themselves. they thought it was perfect because if they're in the caves and if people are coming up you can shoot at them you can pour oil on them whatever you can throw stone so they thought ha ah, Herod's never gonna get us more than that if you look you see the trail the trail is yes. for one person so you can come with 100,000 <laughs> soldiers one at each a time. time is one at a time <laughs> so you can, keep, you can keep yourself very easy but Herod that would work normally but this is Herod the Great we're talking about yes and he says you think you, you win, you mistake. Hmm. He put people, his best soldiers, on the top. Yeah. He took the soldiers, put them on a special... Uh, we call it a crate. Crate. Yeah, like a, a wooden, wooden box. box. And pulled them down. Lowered them, yeah. Lowered down, downhill. And they were in front of the people in the caves. And they, when they've been in front of them, all they shoot them, or they grab them with a special hook. Yeah, down <laughs> like here. This. Be careful, they all. Yeah. <laughs> and they pull him out. And he win. He win. He killed. No one was surrendered. All the people decide that they will be dead and not be uh, captured uh, alive. Ah, okay. So all the people were dead here. One of the stories speak about mm -hmm. one person, an old one that his wife and his children crying to him that they don't want to die. Yeah. And he throw them downhill by himself. Yeah. The, the, the father of the family. And Herod, who was here, told him, I guarantee that I won't do nothing. I will give you your life. Uh, but okay. he decided, he don't believe him. Yeah. Finished to kill his family and throw himself down the cliff. We have stories like this about Gamla not too far from here. And Gamla sad. is not too far from this region. The same kind of story when the Romans came, they heard about how horrible the Romans were. They said, we would rather die by our own hands than be killed by the Romans. And of course, the famous Masada. one, Masada. Big splash. 
you're like a big kid when you get in here, aren't you? Yeah, and I like it. <laughs> so, you know, we're driving on, on a road built by the Syrians, but it's built upon a much more ancient road from the time of Jesus, right? Yes. You can see the, the road is built from stone. From basalt it's stone. basalt, okay, like volcanic stone. It's volcanic stone. This yeah. is the, the road. That, the, this is the material they have it's around everywhere. us. Yes. Yeah, of course. Yeah. But this road is above an ancient road, mm -hmm. the road of the period of time of the Christ, the road that when you, we read in the in the New Testament, New Testament yeah. that the Christ is walking between Kafarnahum, Bethsaida, and Kosi. This is the road that you walk in. Okay, so just to let our viewers know, we're talking about how Jesus was on this side of the Sea of Galilee, ministering in Capernaum, Bethsaida, uh, whatever side here, and when he would take the road and go across to Kersi, Gennesaret, the other side, of course not this road because it's rebuilt, but actually this path, this original location. Yes. Okay, so this is one of those times again where, where the Bible really starts to, to come alive because we can actually walk where the, the, the actual places were. So we're, we're continuing to drive down this ancient road. Now, I don't know if it's just me, but that looks pretty narrow. It's really narrow. It's the wide of the Jeep. And now, I notice you even have to bring the mirrors in because it's that narrow, this road. It's right, and usually if we don't take bring in, the mirror in, it might break. My, that narrow, okay. Yes. And if we spoke about the road, <laughs> I'm not sure it was the same in this place. I don't, I'm not sure if Jesus was crossed through the water here. I hope Jesus is with us now. <laughs> you will need him. Yes. You will need him. Now we just came from that really awesome ancient Syrian road which was built on a first century road from the time of Jesus. And now we've come up, uh, is this, this is Golan now here, this right? This is the Golan Heights. Okay, we've come up a little bit on the Golan and in behind us you can see off in the distance there's one hill that stands alone. It's almost like a hump. And that's a place called Gamla. And if you remember earlier, when we were at Mount Arbel, we talked about uh, an event that took place at Gamla. We said how at Arbel, that rather than be captured by the Romans, the, the Jewish people were, were jumping out to, to get away from the Romans. Now something very similar and incredibly tragic happened here too, right? Yes. In the Great Revolt, the, when the Roman arrived, they came from the north. They came that's right. From Syria. You know, in the Bible it's written, the, 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 all the trouble will start on the north. Mm. The trouble of Jerusalem was from the north. The trouble of Israel is from the north. Mm. So when the Roman arrived here with the with the legion, mm -hmm. they arrived to Gamla. Yeah. And they put Gamla on siege. Yeah. And when after a period of time they succeed to break the wall and enter to the city, the people of Gamla decide to walk to the end of the cliff yeah. and jump down rather yeah. to be captured by the Roman. Yeah. The idea was that we better to be dead than abused, that our women yeah. would be abused by the Roman or be slaves in the Roman area. Yeah. This is the idea. So this is the beginning of the stories of the to the decision mm. of dying rather to yeah. be captured. This is the first one, the second one we find in Masada in yes. the same period of time. That's right. The same revolt. Yeah, I know even in uh, a few seasons ago, if you've been watching First Century, uh, we were at Yodfat, which was another city where the Romans laid siege, uh, where Josephus uh, Flavius Josephus came from. And then they came down here to Gamla, and this has been called the Masada of the North. Of the North because of the amount of people that jumped to their own death. 5,000. 5,000, and there was only not even a 19, thousand. 1900, about 1900 on the mountain of Masada. At Masada, so there was a lot more, more yes. tragic here. Mostly, yes. Yeah. They decide to be dead and then go. The story of uh, Masada, the story of Gamla, and, Masa and the story of Yodfat mm -hmm. is the same period of time. Yeah. The, the commander of the Galilei was Josephus Flavius. That's right, the he great the historian. Who he, he became a historian after, after you That's right. He was the one who make the revolt ready to the Romans. Yeah. He makes the walls, he makes the cities. Even, even uh, we spoke about Migdal. Yes. Migdal that's right. is also Huge. was with the wall because Josephus Flavius and also Yotfat and all of the cities. So. When we speak about these cities, we speak about the Great Revolt. We speak about the, the end of the temple. 
Yeah. This is the story. That, that was the, the end, end of that period. The end of the second temple, the last temple. That's right. Since then, we don't have any more the temple. Then we go to a synagogue, and then it goes on in church, and mm -hmm. all the, the, the area, the house of prey, and not the central one. Yeah. This is the idea. Yeah. Well, folks, we never would have had the opportunity to see all of this if we didn't uh, have a chance to come uh, via Jeep, IYS Jeeps. That's your own company. And I, I always say a huge thank you because you make it fun. Your knowledge and your passion for the land really comes through. And I know that our, our, our viewers have been enjoying it. Thank you uh, very stick much. around and we'll be back right after this. So long. See you in Israel. For 2,000 years, man has been studying the life and words of Jesus. But in our modern culture, can we truly understand what he really meant? Now we can. Joe Amaral's book, Understanding Jesus, removes the veil of history and brings us greater understanding of the time and culture that Jesus and the authors of the Bible lived in. In Understanding Jesus, we study the feasts of the Lord as Jesus celebrated them and find valuable insights into God's prophetic timetable throughout history. Knowing more about his ancient culture will give you accurate insight of the teachings of Jesus and will take your faith to a whole new level. This life-changing book can be yours for just $20. Call today and order your copy of Understanding Jesus by Joe Amaral, 1-877-628-2800 or visit us online at www.firstcentury.tv. Welcome back, and we are here in Jerusalem. And as you can see in behind us, we have a beautiful view of the old city of Jerusalem. You have the, the what everybody knows, the world famous Dome of the Rock. You can see the southern steps in behind us. It's a beautiful day, and I'm here with my favorite person in the world. My favorite person too. Oh, thank you, that was so <laughs> nice. But it's true, we, we love hanging out together, and we've been hanging out at some pretty cool places on this trip. Definitely. And uh, you saw there in the first segment, we were in the north in the Galilee, and we were on top of Mount Arbel, hearing the history of Herod and what he did to get those zealots out of the caves. Mm -hmm. And then uh, going through that really, really narrow river, I didn't know how she was gonna do, but. <laughs> I was actually really excited about it. I had a lot of fun in that one. Yeah, that was surprisingly awesome. I yeah. didn't know she'd be <laughs> such an outdoorsy girl. And so we had a lot of fun. Yeah. But today we wanna continue our series that we're calling, Thou Shall Have a Good Marriage. In the last two segments, we've been talking about the art of communication. And we agreed that it's not something you're born with. It's not something that when you say the vows and you put the wedding ring rings on and all of a sudden, hey, we can communicate perfectly. It's mm -hmm. something that you grow into, you yeah. grow with, in, with one another. Comes with practice. Lots of practice and years of experience. Yeah. And, and praise God, up until this point, we're at 20 years. And we've learned a lot that we've wanted to pass on. And one of the things that, we, that we've learned that's really important is mm -hmm. the timing of when and when not to bring up an important issue. Yeah, timing can be everything. And there are times where I know that it would be um, mm -hmm. a bad time to approach something with you or, and I don't know, I, I think as women, we sometimes, we can sort of feel out when that is, when it's a good time, when it's not a good time. And so mm -hmm. there are times where I know, hey, this is a great time to talk about this. And other times I know, you know what? I'm gonna hold back and I'm gonna wait a little bit maybe in a couple of hours, maybe even tomorrow, mm -hmm. it might might come out a little bit better. Yeah, and also as guys, or not even just for the guys, in, in a marriage, mm -hmm. knowing that your partner, that your spouse is, is ready to hear it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we've talked about how it's how you say it, you know, speak softly, speak kindly, mm -hmm. speak gently. So how you say it is important, but also when you say it is Definitely. important. If your partner, if your spouse isn't ready to hear that conversation or isn't ready to enter into it, you know what, it's, it's like they say running into the wind, it's an uphill climb. So make sure that you have that sensitivity with one another to sense that timing. Mm -hmm. Um, also, something I found very, very important is, is choose your window of opportunity Definitely. carefully. Yes. I don't think it would be appropriate for me, you know, five minutes before that awesome soccer game that you really want to watch <laughs> for me to say, 
we got to talk about this right now. Yeah. This instant. <laughs> and especially, you know, if you've known, I've said, oh, I can't wait to watch this yeah. game on Saturday, and I've been waiting weeks, and then five minutes before the game, yeah, to come in, yeah. you know, choo choose the right time. And, and also, <laughs> Karen's a bit of a of a night owl. She yes. likes to stay up late. <laughs> He's a morning person. <laughs> right. And so even the kids know 10, 15, 10, 30, daddy go bye-bye. It's yeah. it's bedtime for me. So And if, I can remember <laughs> when, we, when we were first married and we'd be having one of those long discussions that would be taking oh, hours. You're going to tell them this. Okay, great. <laughs> he would be lying okay. down and there would be some times where we'd be talking and I would pause sometimes doing the silent thing and he would fall asleep. And that would make me more upset. And I would think, why isn't he staying awake? And I then can't I'd, believe he doesn't yeah. care enough to stay awake. <laughs> so then over the years, we've learned that bedtime, not always the best time to talk. <laughs> yeah, if I fall asleep at 10.30, 10.25 is not the time to yeah. start that real serious communication. I know we're kind of joking a little bit, but it's also, it's very true. You know, we need to learn when is that opportune time? You know, is my is my husband ready to hear this? Is my my wife ready, ready ready to hear this? And uh, one of the things that we we've, we've practiced doing is, well, you know, we try to. It's not every night. We're not a perfect couple, but try to create a habit, a routine of mm -hmm. communication. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, ha have times when you talk, yeah. and a lot of times it does work at bedtime. And at bedtime and a lot of times I find if we go on a walk, if we go on a drive sometimes, I find that those are the times where there's no distractions, there's no phone, there's no television, there's no, mm -hmm. you know, anything that we can get out on our walk and, and just be completely one another, with one another. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, being open. Again, building communication into your relationship. Uh, a lot of times you know, we have uh, this false sense of what you know, marriage is going to be like mm -hmm. because we watch the movies, everything's perfect, everybody's great. Um, mm -hmm. You know, everybody wakes up and their hair looks perfect and everybody's in love all day, every day. But the truth is, is that a good marriage takes a lot of hard work. Mm -hmm. it, doesn't, mm -hmm. it doesn't just happen. You can have two wonderful people. You know, and Karen, I always say to her, you make it so easy to stay married to you. And, you know, and it's true. Nice to but, hear. but even more than that is we, we work at it. We do. We do. You know, and the, the stats, unfortunately, between, you know, Christian and non-Christian marriages, the divorce rate is the same. So it's not enough to say, well, I'm a Christian. Everything's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's just, it doesn't work that way. We need to really work hard together. Definitely. And one of the rules we've also had is that if there's a disagreement between us, we're going to keep it to ourselves until we're alone. And yes. we don't do it in front of the children. Right. We don't do it in front of other people. This is our thing. Mm -hmm. This is what we take to our room. We take behind closed doors, but yeah. that's we, where it we, stays. We talk it through. Talk I mean, it through, yeah. I'm sure there's been uh, times where you've been out with another couple, you've been out with friends, and you know they start to argue and I gotta tell you, it's a really awkward it's feeling. It's awkward, yeah. And you don't know what to do. Like, don't know where to look. <laughs> yeah, do you interfere? Do you let them go for it? I mean, what do you do? So it's really important to learn to... Self-control. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I know, look, it's gonna shock a lot of you. I'm not perfect, okay? There are things that I do <laughs> eh, once every couple of years that might upset her. And, and, and I know that I've said, oh, I, I shouldn't have done that. And I could tell she's upset. You know what? We get through the evening and do what we have to do. But on, on the drive home, there's no fear. We say, listen, I know we need to talk about what happened back there. Yeah. And when you talk about it and you've dealt with it. Leave it in the past. Leave the past yeah. alone. Yeah. One of, I don't know if you want to speak to that because I, I know how much it bothers me when you know, you hear a couple who have gone through stuff and they've forgiven each other and they say they've worked through it. And every time there's an argument, that comes right back up exactly. in the face and you're never going to move past that yeah. forgiveness. You're never going to move past that healing if you don't learn to, to leave it where it belongs mm -hmm. in the past. Yeah, and I, I'm reminded of the verse in Proverbs 17:9. Mm. It says, he who covers an offense promotes love. Yeah. But whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. And I like to think in a relationship, you're each other's friend. Best friend. And it can it can separate you by continually bringing up the past and and mm -hmm. sort of you know we've cut that thing off at the root. Let's leave it. Let's leave it. Let's leave it. Again, I hope that the principles you've learned about communication will help you to have the marriage that God wants you to have.
God's Holy Days, the new DVD teaching series by Joe Amaral. Filmed in a conference speaking environment, infused with rich visuals such as photos and realistic video reenactments, this series will take you on an exciting journey of discovery. In God's Holy Days, you'll learn the meaning behind many symbolic parallels that have long been forgotten by the church. Find out why most Western believers have little knowledge of these feasts and how much there is to gain once we understand them. This three and a half hour teaching series will show you how Jesus is both concealed and revealed in the Feast of the Lord from Passover through Tabernacles. You'll be amazed as Joe describes in detail how these feasts can still powerfully apply to all believers everywhere. Included with the purchase of this DVD is a seven week study guide to help you personally apply these many truths. To order your copy, call right now, 1-877-628-2800. Welcome back, and we're in downtown Haifa. Now, you might have heard the media say that Jews and Arabs can't get along. Well, we're about to go inside this church and meet a pastor who's going to shed some light that's going to help you understand the situation. Well, shalom, mister. How you doing? Shalom, mister. <laughs> Long time no see. Long time no see. You were one of the first pastors I met when I came to Israel on my first trip in November 2002, if you can believe it. Wow. Welcome back. Well, thank it's you very much. Time. I know. I won't wait eight years. I promise. I promise. Now, the building has actually changed a lot since last time I was here. I've noticed that you guys have grown a little bit. Yeah, we had to expand the, the room here because it was getting too small. Yeah. And uh, things have changed and happened in the congregation, mm -hmm. so we're, we're happy to... Yeah. Yeah. Well, I always, my heart was always bent towards this ministry. Uh, you know, I love all the ministries here in Israel. Everybody is doing something unique. Uh, back home in North America, we hear a lot about uh, how the Jewish and the Arab community in Israel, not, not the Palestinians and the Israelis, but even within Israel proper, that there's a lot of tension between those two people groups. And uh, we were joking, and I said, Ta-da! You, you kind of break that mold because you're yeah. Arabic by, by birth, but yet you pastor a Hebrew-speaking congregation here in Haifa. How does, how does that happen? Well, I grew up in a believing home. Both of my parents were Arabs, but also believers. Here and or somewhere in Haifa. Else? In Haifa, in Haifa. Okay. And uh, as believers, they believed in the scriptures. And if you believe in the scriptures, my father said, well, Israel is God's people. Mm -hmm. This is God's land. Uh, deal with it. Wow, yeah, <laughs> okay. So uh, anyway, we were sent actually to Jewish schools and I grew up speaking Hebrew as my mother tongue along with I had two younger brothers, it's the same with mm -hmm. them. So in one sense, yeah. we, I mean, the Lord was guiding us to uh, this kind of ministry from a very young age. Okay. So I actually grew up in this congregation. But how do you make the step from just an Arab who learns and believes what the scripture says to actually saying I'm going to pastor a Hebrew speaking congregation like how did you make that jump well uh, it's about God's uh, calling and gifting and uh, yeah. uh, um, so I just we just knew this is God that's what he wants us to do now do you do you get any kind of reaction you know outside the land if you travel to Canada or the States and tell people what you do do people say what <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, people yeah. think it's it's, uh, it's special. I guess I'm the only Arab pastoring a Messianic congregation. <laughs> really? In yeah, that's what they say uh, wow. in the world. I don't know. But uh, wow. I, did, I didn't check, so. <laughs> that's <laughs> but, uh, incredible. But for me, it's it's uh, natural in yeah. our new nature in, in the Messiah. Yeah. We are one. It's not just a fake thing, and it's not man-made. Mm -hmm. it, it's real. I mean, I, I love what you're saying, and I hear your heart. And, you know, when we first met back in 2002, I was just really taken back by what God was calling you to do and to see what you're doing now and how God is growing the ministry. It's just, it's really, really a blessing. And if you were to say one thing to our viewers back home, what would you say to them? How can Canadians and Americans, how can they pray for you specifically here in this congregation? Well, this congregation is a miracle. It's, uh, it's uh, God doing something. And uh, if He doesn't do it, and if He doesn't build, nothing will happen. So we really appreciate your prayers. We need your prayers daily. Uh, I don't know when you th we talk about the congregation and we, you know, talk about ministry and different things we do and activities. It seems sometimes too much like a brochure, where it's nice mm. and colorful. And but we're dealing with people, and uh, people who God loves. But it doesn't doesn't mean it's easy. 
and people have been people have come to faith lately with uh, with quite a background that de demands a lot of uh, care, mm. uh, counseling, uh, really sharing the word of God and, and praying that the words the, those seeds will really grow and and uh, bring fruit in people's lives. So really pray for uh, what's going on here in Beit Eliyahu for the people here and their lives, for the single mothers and the mm -hmm. couples that are struggling, for the children. Uh, for the students, for our soldiers who are in, in tough positions. Mm -hmm. uh, almost everybody in this congregation uh, is living by faith, not almost, they all live by faith and they need prayer. So your prayer support is, I mean, it's an understatement to say we need it. Mm -hmm. So to find out how you can support this congregation, go to firstcentury.tv or call the toll-free number. It's there on the bottom of the screen. And we'll be happy to send you out the Israel Prayer Watch on a bi-monthly basis. And yes, he said pray. Absolutely, we need to pray. But also pray about what God will have you do to give, to bless this ministry, to continue to expand, to do what they've been called to do. I just want to say thank you so much for the opportunity uh, to come here, Shemuel, and meet with you. Thank you for sharing your heart. Very, very welcome. Amen. We'll be right back. We have had so much fun on the program today. I hope that you enjoyed watching it. We sure had a lot of fun making it. And it wouldn't have been possible without our good friend here, Yodon, at IYS Jeeps. Um, you know, I hope you had a good time today with us on the yes, program as I, well. I was enjoyed, really. Maybe I will pay you to come to me. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Sounds like a good deal. Uh, we were saying in the truck, he's, he's just a big kid. You should see him, you know, driving, splashing through water, going in these tight spots, going up hills. And he kept saying, I think we'll be okay. We should be okay. And anyways, we were okay. Um, would you do me a favor, please, and invite those who are watching back home in Canada uh, to come and see Israel? Gladly. People, <laughs> come to Israel. Feel the past, see the past, enjoy the present, and maybe you will see the future. Mm. Israel is the best place to be in. Just come, see where we've been, where we're going to. It's amazing. Thank you and I am waiting for you in Israel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yaron. And uh, I do really want to encourage you uh, to come with us on uh, a tour here to Israel. Uh, go to firstcentury.tv or call the toll-free number. It's there on the bottom of the screen. Find out when we're coming to Israel next. And if you want to stay in touch with us, the best way to do that is actually to join our Facebook group. Uh, just go on to Facebook and type in Joe Amaral Public and you'll see a public page that we have there and click on like and you'll be privy to all the latest information. Uh, whenever I come to Israel, we put updates, we put on photos, little video clips, just to kind of keep you informed as to what's going on. Uh, updates that are happening here in Israel, things that are going on in the ministry, places where I'm speaking, uh, any media that we're doing. So go to Facebook and log on, become a friend of the page, and just stay up to date with everything that we're doing. Again, I really hope that you enjoyed watching. We had a, a great time making the show, and we'll see you next time. God bless. Thank you. God bless you.